<coughs> Innal hamdulillah nahmuduhu wa nasta'inu wa nastaghfiruh wa nu'minu bihi tawakkalu alayhi wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyiati a'malina may yahdihillahu fala mudilla lahu wa may yudlil fala hadiya amma ba'd Faqad qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hubbul ansar min al-iman The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that to love the ansar is from iman and in another hadith he stated that whoever loves the ansar is a believer and whoever hates the ansar is a munafiq a hypocrite today i want us to take some time to reflect on the story of and the status of the ansar because this is in my opinion the more undervalued part of the sahaba when we talk about the sahaba and the lives of the sahaba most of us are familiar with the lives of the muhajirun the immigrants we are familiar with the story of abu bakr and umar and usman and ali radiyallahu anhum ajma'in we are familiar with the stories of the ashra mubashara and the ummahat al mu'minin but many of us many of us may, may not be as familiar with the stories of the people of medina we know that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam preached islam in makkah for 13 years and towards the end of those 13 years things got so difficult that he had to seek a way out he had to look for somewhere else to live and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened the doors for him to move to yathrib which would become medina and so when he and his companions moved to yathrib the people of yathrib the believers of yathrib who welcomed them in who took them into their families who treated them as their own family these the people became known as the ansar the helpers and those who had moved from makka to medina they became known as the muhajirun the immigrants and so from that point the sahaba of two categories we have the muhajirun and the ansar we have those who immigrated from makkah and those who were born in medina but what i want us to get at today is to understand who the ansar were in terms of the importance in our religion who the ansar were what is their story what is their legacy and why we should take time to learn their biographies to understand who they are and to love them the hadith we quoted in the beginning said that the love of the ansar is part of iman but if you don't know somebody you can't really love them you can't really appreciate them if you don't know their story and that's a problem that many of us have that we know of the ansar as this terminology but we don't know of the ansar in terms of what they went through what they sacrificed what they did what they accomplished and even what their names were so let's go to the story of the ansar abad so we can appreciate who these people were and what role they played in the history of islam medina as we know it today back then it was called yatrib right it was a small town of palm trees and in yatrib there were two arab tribes the aus and the khazraj these two arab tribes the aus and the khazraj were constantly at war with each other so this town was constantly in a state of civil war with these two tribes always at each other's throats living around the town were jews there were three jewish tribes living around the town in their own fortresses and these jews controlled the marketplace uh, they were the businessmen of the area the arabs were farmers and the jews were uh, businessmen and together that's how the economy ran and what would happen was these jewish tribes actually moved there because the torah had predicted it was they had learned from the torah and predicted from the torah that the last prophet will arise in that city and that is where the last prophet would be so they moved to yathrib and they formed the communities in yathrib hoping that the last prophet will rise from amongst them in yathrib and they used to tell the arabs that when the last prophet comes we are getting rid of all of you and this is going to be our land so this is the city and the climate in which the ansar come about now what happens around the same year that we call the year of sorrow right the year when rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam lost his beloved wife khadija radhiyallahu anha lost his uncle abu talib was chased out of taif around that same time while all of that's going on in makkah in yathrib a civil war breaks out between the aus and the khazraj and this civil war was known as the war of buaf that's a, because that's the place where it took place and this war was absolutely bloody it was a massacre 
all of the leaders on both sides were killed. So in one battle, both the Aus and the Khazraj lost almost all of their elders. The entire generation of this tribe was wiped out. And in light of that, in light of an entire generation of elders and leaders being wiped out, their children now have to take over running their tribes. So now suddenly, the, Ara the Arabs of, Mad of Yatrib are these small tribes and their leaders are often the teenagers. Really, the leaders of Yatrib at, at, at this time are people who are between the ages of 15 and 25. Very, very young men with no experience yet in life. But they all have one thing in common. They are tired of fighting each other. They are tired of the wars. They saw the wars destroy their family. They saw the wars tear apart their community. They saw their own parents killed. And they are tired of the war. So these leaders, one of the first things they decide to do, because they're tired of fighting, they're tired of that environment, they just want to get out, they say, let's go for Hajj. Let's go for Hajj. And so about 12 of the leaders of the different tribes of the Aus and the Khazraj, because remember, Aus and Khazraj are the mega tribes, and each of these tribes are split into smaller tribes. So 12 of these leaders, all young men, they leave Yatrib and they go to Makkah for Hajj. Around that time, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is by the Hajj doing da'wah to every delegation that comes. And he speaks specifically to those delegations that are powerful. Where they have elderly tribal leaders who are known for their power and for their might and for the influence over society. And these are the people he's doing da'wah to hoping that they would convert and invite him to their city and protect him. This is the same reason why he went to Toif. And then he sees this group of young men. And they want to hear his message. And he's, at this time, it's just him and Abu Bakr and Ali walking around doing da'wah. And Abu Bakr... Abu Bakr Rajulanu has this special skill, right? He has this special knowledge and skill set, uh, something that's a lost art in our times, which is the knowledge of lineage. He can tell, like, you know, you, you get the, uh, the old uncle to tell you, oh, you relate to this guy, this person, your cousin, and that person's your auntie. They know everyone how they're related to each other. Abu Bakr was gifted at this. If he met anyone, he knew that person's family. He would tell you, okay, you relate to this person in this way and in that way. And this is a skill, and this is an art form, and it's a very important skill, one that's dying out these days. But it's very important skill. So what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was doing was, every tribe he went to do da'wah to, he would ask Abu Bakr to tell him how they are related, and how they are connected, and to tell him about their lineage and their tribal influence. So when this group of young men come from Yatrib, Abu Bakr tells him, these are your relatives from, from, from Yatrib, right? Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's grandfather and, madi, and mother were from that region, that these are your relatives of Yatrib, and they are orphans, and they are young, and they don't have power. They don't have money, but they want to hear us out. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sits with these young men, very young men, and he gives them the da'wah, and he recites to them Quran, and he explains to, to, to them Islam, and all of them take their shahada, all of them convert to Islam on the spot. Because they recognize that these Jewish tribes, they're telling us a prophet is going to come, a prophet is going to come. Here's the prophet. Let's embrace him first. And they recognize in him all the signs of truthfulness. And this is an honest prophet. This is, the, this is the true prophet of Allah. So they not only convert to Islam, but they become staunch followers of Islam. They become the staunchest supporters of Islam. And so these young men, they tell the Prophet wasallam, send someone back with us who can teach our people the religion. So Rasulullah wasallam chooses a young man for Makkah by the name of Mus'ab ibn Umair. And he sends him with this delegation to Yatrib to teach the people Islam. So Mus'ab ibn Umair becomes the first da'i, the first person given the job to go to another city to do da'wah. And he goes to Yatrib. And he sits with each of the tribal leaders. And he does da'wah to them. And one by one, the leaders of Yatrib convert to Islam. And what happens? A ripple effect. He, gives, he does da'wah to one leader. That leader goes to his people and says, I'm a Muslim now, you all better become Muslim. And many of them become Muslims. Same thing happens to the next tribe. Next, same thing happens to the next tribe. One year later, a delegation of over 70 people from Medina come for Hajj. All of them Muslims. And they go to meet Rasulullah in secret. And they make a pledge to him. And they make a pledge that you and your followers can come and live in Medina. And we will protect you. We will provide for you. We will die for you. They made a pledge to defend these people with their lives. Keep in mind that they didn't even know them on a personal level, right? They didn't know them on a personal level. These are two different cities with two different, you know, uh, political situations. And these are young men. These are people who don't have much influence. 
Right? These are people who don't have much money and power compared to what the people of Makkah had. But they had Iman. They had true Iman. They truly believed in the message of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they were willing to die for him. So they took a pledge of allegiance and so the Hijrah began. The Hijrah began and group by group the people of Makkah, the Muslims of Makkah start moving to Yathrib until eventually Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself moves from Makkah to Yathrib and then they change the name of Yathrib to Madinatul Munawwara or Madinatul Nabi, the city of the Prophet. Now, what we fail to understand about the story is how much the people of Medina sacrificed for the people of Makkah. How much this community sacrificed for the immigrants who were coming to their land. And I believe this is a very relevant topic for our times. Because we live in a time of xenophobia. For every country, people are scared of immigrants. Every country, people don't want immigrants in their community, right? And we see this even amongst Muslims. But nobody wants immigrants. Everybody feels immigrants are stealing their jobs and taking their money and, you know, uh, opening up businesses and, and marrying their people. And, and they look at immigrants in a very negative sense. But with the Ansar, with the Ansar, you see the complete opposite. Not only do they welcome the immigrants into their community, they welcome them into their homes. They, they offer them half of their wealth. They are willing to die for them. They are willing to die for them. They sit and make dua for them at night. It is mentioned that the Ansar would make dua in the Tahajjud for the Muhajirin. They would make dua for the brothers who had moved there from Makkah. They form such a strong brotherhood between the people of Makkah and the people of Medina, between the Muhajirun and Ansar, that they literally became like brothers. They literally became like brothers to such an extent that they thought they might have to inherit from each other because they came this close in their love for each other and in their care for each other. And so this is like one of the, the purest examples in history of a community inviting in immigrants and taking care of the immigrants and doing it in such a way that they sacrificed everything for them. And we don't even realize this, but they sacrificed their own political power for the Muhajiru. What do we mean by this? These young men were supposed to be the leaders of that city. But when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam moves to Medina, they choose him to be their leader. And after him, Abu Bakr. And after him, Umar. And after him, Usman. The Ansar never attain leadership. They never attain leadership to that level. They sacrifice and give up the very concept of leadership so they can be with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa so they can support Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa so that they can be from his closest companions. And on that day when they, made their, when they made that pledge, they stood there in that mountain in secret with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and his uncle Abbas. And they told Rasulullah sallallahu they said, we are taking you and your people in and we are going to protect you, we are going to fight for you. What do we get in exchange? We're going to do all of these sacrifices. What do we get in exchange? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not tell them you're going to get power, you're going to get money, you know, your city is going to become one of the greatest cities in, in human history, people are going to visit it for thousands of years after you. No. They only give them one promise in return. If you live up to this promise, if you do what you say you're going to do, then you, your promise is Jannah. You're going to get Jannah. And all of them said, this is the best deal. This is the best deal. That we will sacrifice everything of this world for Jannah. And we see time and time again the Ansar honoring this pledge to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Not only do they invite the immigrants into, uh, into, into Medina and they house them in their own houses as guests and offer them half of their wealth and take care of them and help them to grow into society and to establish themselves in socii into society and they intermarry amongst each other. Even though these are different tribes, you could easily have said, you know, you're not for our tribe, you can't marry our daughters. They intermarried with each other and they became one community. But we see them sacrificing for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam over and over again. And so we come to the first battle, the battle of Badr. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is sitting with his companions deciding, do we fight or do we not fight? And the Muhajirin, the people of Makkah are all standing up one by one and saying, let's go fight, let's go fight. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is still sitting quietly. He's waiting for the Ansar to speak. And then the leader of the Ansar stands up and said, we took a pledge with you in that mountain that we're going to fight for you. Today we're going to honor that pledge. And they went and they fought and they died. Many of the Ansar died. They died in, in, in Badr, they died in Uhud, they died in Ahzab. And they died as Shuhada. They died of martyrs for the sake of Allah. 
So this was a community that sacrificed everything for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we owe it to them to at least learn their biographies, learn their names, learn their stories, make dua for them, love them, and try and emulate their lifestyles. Try to be like them. And this is why over the next few weeks, for every khutbah, we're going to take the life of one of the Ansar and discuss it in details. We're going to go into the lives of those Sahaba who were born in Medina and who were known to be amongst the leaders of the Ansar and go to their biographies in detail so we can understand who these amazing people were and what was their role in our history so our love of them can increase. We started the khutbah with the hadith where the Prophet wasallam said that the love of the Ansar is from Iman. The love of the Ansar is from Iman. And in another hadith he said that whoever loves the Ansar then they are believers and whoever hates the Ansar they are hypocrites. Now there is a story behind this. Remember we said that the Ansar sacrificed political leadership so that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa could live amongst them. There was one man in Mecca, in Medina, who was supposed to become the next political leader of Medina. His name was Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. And he, he had this in mind that now that all the elders are dead, I'm next in line. I'm going to rule the city. And then suddenly everybody else converts to Islam. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa moves to Medina. They appoint him as the leader. So what does this Abdullah ibn Ubay do? He pretends to be a Muslim. He pretends to be a Muslim so he can try and destroy Islam from the inside. And he holds deep resentment towards his fellow Madinites, towards the Ansar. He has a deep resentment towards the Ansar because he feels they took power away from him and gave it to a foreigner. And he and his followers hold a deep hatred for the Ansar because they feel that their power was taken away and given to a foreign man. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was referring to them specifically when he said that whoever hates the Ansar is a munafiq, is a hypocrite. He was referring specifically to Abdullah ibn Ubi and his followers. But nonetheless, the Aqidah point, uh, uh, it, it applies to everyone until the end of time. You cannot love this religion without loving the Ansar. And you cannot love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam without loving his Ansar. Because he loved the Ansar. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loved him and we love what he loves. Because these are the people, if it wasn't for their sacrifice, if it wasn't for them welcoming immigrants into their city, if it wasn't for them sacrificing all of their lives and their wealth and everything for the sake of Allah, we would not have had the city of Medina. Yatrib would have stayed Yatrib. And a different door may have opened for Rasulullah so in a different city. But Allah chose this group of people to be those heroes who established this role. And so we should learn their names. We should learn their biographies. We should name our children after them. And we should love the Ansar. Because love of the Ansar is from Iman. We ask Allah to guide us and to protect us and to make us from those who love the Ansar and the Muhajirun and the Sahaba and who follow this religion properly. Subhana Rabbika Rabbil Izzat Yama Yasifun wa Salam Nala Mursaleen wa Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillahi Wahta wa Salatu wa Salamu ala man la nabiya ba'da amma ba'd wa inna asakal hadith kitabullah. وَخَيْرُ حَدِي حَدِي مُحَمَّدٍ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَشَرُ الْأُمُورِ مُحْتَسَاتُهَا وَكُلُّ مُحْتَسَةٍ بِدْعَةٍ وَكُلُّ بِدْعَةٍ ضَلَالًا وَكُلُّ ضَلَالَةٍ فِي النَّارِ When Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم conquered Makkah, the Ansar began to worry. Why did they begin to worry? Because with Makkah now being Muslim, Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم was free to go home. He was free to go back to the city he came from, the city he grew up in, his hometown. And we all know, if, you, if someone is, is exiled from their hometown and the chance opens up to go back, you're going back. Right? Everyone loves their hometown. So the Ansar begin to worry. They see the people of Makkah converting to Islam. The same people who used to be the enemies of Islam. They see Rasulullah giving the people of Makkah a lot of wealth right, to win them over to Islam. And they begin to worry. And they begin to talk amongst themselves. And they begin to be scared that they're not going to see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa again. So he calls a private meeting with the Ansar. And he tells them that, you know, I've done this for you and I've done that for you. you know, that I brought Islam to you and given you victory and all of this. So what do you have to say? And they kept quiet. And he says, y'all could, you, you could have said the same thing to me. That y'all invited me into your home. Y'all gave me shelter. Y'all gave me a place to stay when I was in exile. But the Ansar had so much respect for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that they didn't mention their favors. They sat quietly. And then he said that I have one last thing to give you. I'm coming home with you. 
I'm coming home with you. The Medina is my home. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even though, even though Makkah was not open for him, even though he could go back to Makkah, the land he was born in, he spent the rest of his life in Medina, he passed away in Medina, he is buried in Medina, it is called Medina to Nabi, the city of the Prophet, because of his love of the Ansar. Because of his love of the Ansar. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loved the Ansar so much that he said, if I was not a Muhajir, I would have wanted to be an Ansar. And he was a Muhajir by default. He's moving from Makkah to Medina. But he knew that the reward of the Ansar for their sacrifice was so great, he wanted to be one of them. He wanted to be amongst the Ansar. Final lesson for all of us. Every single Muslim, at some point in their life, has a chance to be an Ansar. What do I mean by this? There are many people who migrate to our community hoping for a better life. They may come from India or Pakistan or from Malawi or from many other countries across North Africa and Central Africa. Many people trying to escape poverty, trying to escape ty tyrannical regimes. They come here looking for a better life. The question we need to ask ourselves, are we welcoming them into our community? Are we an Ansar to them or are we cutting them off? Are we treating them like we are better than them? Are we ignoring them and focusing only on ourselves? Are we ansar to the immigrants to our community? Because this may not be an Islamic land, but Allah has blessed us with a strong Muslim community. Allah has blessed us with resources. He has blessed us with freedom of religion. He has blessed us with influence. Are we using it to help the immigrants? Are we reaching out to the immigrants? When you hear of a family coming from India or Pakistan or Malawi or anywhere else, from Egypt, Turkey, from anywhere, they're coming and they're settling in Durban. Are any of us reaching out to them? Are any of us making friends with them? Are any of us seeing if we can help them? Let us be Ansar to the immigrants. Let us not stereotype them. Let us not be racist towards them. Let us not be xenophobic towards them. These are our brothers and sisters in Islam. And they, many of them are fleeing from very terrible situations to seek a better life where we are. And the, the, most, the least we can do for them is to honor the legacy of the Ansar by being Ansar ourselves. And I want to end with the, this word Ansar, where does it come from? Where does this word Ansar come from? When you open Sahih al-Bukhari, the chapter of the virtues of the Ansar, the very first hadith in that chapter, a man comes to Anas ibn Malik and says, did you call yourselves Ansar or did Allah call you Ansar? Look at this question, did you call yourselves Ansar or did Allah call you Ansar? And Anas ibn Malik, who was one of the Ansar we will discuss in the coming weeks, he said, Allah called us the Ansar. Allah called us the Ansar. When you open the Quran, there are many verses. Where Allah said, Al-Muhajiruna wal-Ansar. He calls him the Ansar. And the word Ansar is used in the Quran for two groups of people. The first is the Ansar of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the second is the Ansar of Jesus, peace be upon him. Where we have the verse in the Quran, where when Jesus, peace be upon him, is being attacked by the Romans and they want to kill him, and he says, Man ansari illallah. Who's going to be my ansar and help me for the sake of Allah? His disciples said, We are the ansar of Allah. So, this term ansar, those who help the people in need, was mentioned in the Quran for two very important and powerful groups of people. Two people who sacrifice everything for the sake of Allah. The disciples of Jesus, peace be upon him, and the ansar of Rasulullah. So, my Final message to each and every one of us. Let us live lives of Ansar. Let us live, live lives where we care for others more than we care for ourselves. Let us live lives where we put our resources into helping the Dawah and helping the poor and helping those around us. Let us welcome immigrants and help them to settle into the community. Let us be the Ansar of any believer that we meet. That is the least we can do to honor the legacy of the great Ansar who helped Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يسفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين أقيم السلام.